All right, so today's the, the, the cream of the crop for the whole polynomials unit. We're going to talk about factoring and solving polynomials today. Everything that we have done in this unit up to now has built uh, towards actually doing this today. Uh, very, very important skill. Probably going to be a pretty long lesson today. I mean, you can see how long the video is right now. So let's see if I eat my words. Let's get going. So like I said, we're going to tie together all of the last few concepts that we've learned today. Buckle up. It's going to take a while, right? Uh, we will learn how to factor any factorable polynomial up to degree five. You might remember we've already factored polynomials of degree two. That was in previous years where we did some product rule or difference of squares, et cetera. Uh, and even last class, we kind of barely started looking at factoring a polynomial, uh, I believe of degree three is what we did. Uh, we will also learn how to solve any factorable polynomial algebraically because graphing with a calculator is just too baby food for us. By solve, of course, I mean like find the x-intercepts. Uh, we'll get into that, of course. And then we'll also look at solving polynomials graphically with a graphing calculator, because you know what? Sometimes baby food isn't so bad. Sometimes it's okay to say, you know what? Let the calculator do the work for us. Nothing wrong in that. Anyway, let's get going. So before we begin, let's just recall a few things. Factoring a polynomial involves breaking the polynomial down into the multiple of several binomials. In other words, you can take your whole polynomial P of X and just write it as something times something times something, yada, yada, yada. Now, solving a polynomial, on the other hand, involves finding the value or values of x that make the polynomial equal to some given number. Ideally, it would be equal to 0. 99% of the time, we're solving for where it's equal to 0. Uh, once your polynomial is equal to 0, you need to factor a polynomial first before you can solve it. Once you have it in this kind of factored form, where each individual binomial factor is equal to zero would tell you what values of x would make the whole thing equal to zero. So the solutions are the values of x that make each binomial equal to zero. Generally speaking, if you have a degree three polynomial, there's going to be three different factors that you'll end up having. If you have a degree four polynomial, there'd be four factors. A degree five polynomial, there'd be five factors and so on. So in other words, when you have it down in factored form, you can just look at where each of those binomial factors are equal to zero, and that'll tell you where the whole polynomial becomes equal to zero. So you'd be solving it that way. All right, so before we really get into this, I want us to make sure we've totally mastered factoring degree two polynomials. This is from Math 10 and Math 20. So there were three different methods we had. I'll do two on this slide and one on the next. The first one is the sum product rule. The sum product rule just states the middle number is going to represent a sum the last number is going to represent a product. And then you have the little puzzle slash logic trick uh, to solve for what values would give you the sum of that number and a product of the other. So in this example I gave, we're looking for two numbers with a sum of negative three, but a product of negative 10. Again, this can be very tricky for some people. It can take a while. I always say focus on the product. What two numbers would multiply to give me negative 10? In this case, the answer to this would be negative five and positive two, because negative uh, five plus two is negative three negative five times positive two is equal to negative 10. So X minus five and X plus two, that would be the solution to this right here. That would be what we would do to factor it, right? So Y equals this. Now, the other way we do this uh, is something called the adapted sum product rule. Now, the reason this one's different is uh, we have to use an adapted rule where it's not just looking for a sum and a product uh, when we have a leading coefficient that isn't positive one. So in this case, we have a leading coefficient of two. So this is gonna change things a little bit. The sum is still going to be your middle number. That doesn't change. The sum is always the middle number. The product, however, is two times negative 10. So negative 20. The first number times the last number gives us our product. Two times negative 10, negative 20. So what this question is really asking is, we need to find two numbers that give us a sum of eight, but a product of negative 20. Like I said before, this can be tricky. But I'll tell you right now, in this question, it would be positive 10 and negative 2. Positive 10 plus negative 2 is positive 8. Positive 10 times negative 2 is negative 20. Let me even write this. Positive 10, negative 2. Now, here's what sucks about the adapted sum product rule. You can't just jump straight to a, a factored form like you could with the normal sum product rule. You have to do this long thing where you break apart the middle term. So we're going to break apart this middle, middle term here, 8x. Uh, using these two numbers we found. So we're going to say y equals 2x squared plus 10x minus 2x and then minus 10, right? So we just take 
this X, uh, this eight X here, and we broke it apart using these two numbers we just found. The next thing, and this is where things get really weird, you put brackets around the first two and brackets around the second two. Now, something funny is happening in this one because there was a minus right in the middle. When there's a minus right in the middle and you put brackets around these last two terms, uh, the minus has to double dip through here. So it's actually gonna change this minus 10 to a plus 10. Now, I always joke, if you didn't catch it in that step, you would catch it in the ne next step because something fishy is going to happen here, right? Anyway, what we do after we put brackets around the first two and brackets around the next two uh, is we factor those. So think about what number we could take out of these two terms here. Well, I know I could take out 2x. So this will become 2x times x plus 5 minus what could we take out of these ones? Well, I could take out a 2, so that'll take out 2 here, and that leaves us with x plus 5. Notice how there's an x plus 5 on both of these. That's how we know we've actually done this correctly. If there's the same kind of binomial factor on both of them, you know you've done it right. So if you didn't change it to 2x plus 10 on that last step there, you would have caught it here because you would have seen you would have had uh, x plus 5 and x minus 5. And that tells you something, something kind of funny would have happened. Anyway, since x plus 5 is on both of these, we might as well just take that out of here now. So it's x plus 5 times whatever's left over, 2x minus 2. So that right there is our factored form. It's x plus 5 times 2x minus 2. The adapted sum product rule really sucks. I don't like using it unless I absolutely have to. You actually could have gotten away with not using it here if you had factored a 2 out of all this, but that doesn't always work. So is what it is. The third one is actually low-key my favorite one here because uh, as soon as you identify that you have one like this, they all work the same. This is a difference of squares. What a difference of squares is, it's where you have two numbers that are perfectly square rootable and they're being subtracted from one another. So it's a difference of squares. Here's how we factor it. When you notice you have a difference of squares, in other words, when you say, yeah, I can square root this and I can square root this, to factor this, you just square root each term. So the square root of 9x squared is 3x minus the square root of the other term, square root of 49, of course, is 7. But then you multiply this by the exact same thing, except with a plus sign in between. So then 3x plus seven. Now I'm not gonna show it, but if you wanted to prove that this was done correctly, you could just multiply this all through, you'll find that you get this back again, right? So long story short, to factor a difference of squares, you square root the first piece minus the square root of the second piece, and then multiply by the same thing again, just with a plus sign in the middle. People often forget that step, but you have to finish it off. It has to be um, fully factored that way. Anyway, moving on, that's, that's just review of math 10 and math 20. We are going to need these skills before we move on today. So factoring polynomials, the whole big picture here. In Math 30-1, we will need to know how to factor or fully factor polynomials of degree higher than two. So a cubic function or a quartic function or a quintic function, et cetera. This isn't quite as clear as factoring a quadratic. We don't just have a sum product rule or an adapted sum product rule, et cetera. We have to be a little bit more uh, creative with this. So we've already factored a few polynomials of degree higher than two, uh, like that was what we did yesterday. Uh, but the binomial factor that you use to factor the polynomial was always just given to us. I just said, okay, we're gonna divide by X minus five, for instance. Uh, how can we find binomials that divide a polynomial ourselves? So instead of being spoon fed uh, a starting point, how can we find that for ourselves? So if I gave you a big polynomial, how could you, how could you start with factoring that? Well, we need to know something first, something called the integral zero theorem. Here's what it states. The integral zero theorem states, if x minus a is a factor of the polynomial p of x, then a, so the thing in here, must also be a factor of the constant term in the polynomial p of x. That's a huge big secret that comes out here right now, right? The, the value uh, of the a inside of a binomial that divides the whole thing that a value actually has to also be a factor of the constant term. That's that number that doesn't have an x attached to it at the very end uh, of a polynomial. So in other words, the factors of the constant term may be used as the a in the binomial x minus a to divide the whole polynomial. Keep in mind though, really, really, really important for us to understand, not every factor of the constant term works. This is what's gonna really suck. You have to use the factor slash remainder theorem, that's where you plug it in and see if it equals zero, uh, to check. So you'll be checking to see if P of A equals zero. If it does, then X minus A will be a factor. From there, you have to use long division or synthetic division and re repeat the process if necessary. 
to simplify this down, because that was a lot of words that probably didn't make a lot of sense. Basically, if you have a long polynomial and then it ends with, let's say, plus 10, that's our constant term. In order to factor this, you have to think of all the factors of 10. Well, that would be positive 1 or negative 1, uh, positive, oops, positive or negative 2, uh, positive or negative 5, and positive or negative 10. All eight of those numbers there are possible factors uh, of 10, right? Uh, now, the reason we have to include negatives is because think of it this way, negative 1 times negative 10 is positive 10. That's going to be a factor as well. But anyway, long story short, any of those numbers could be the a in x minus a, right? So we might be able to divide that whole polynomial by x minus 2, or maybe x plus 2, or maybe x minus 10, or anything like that. In order to check which one it is going to be, you just have to plug in p of a for each of these. So you plug in like, okay, let's test negative 2. You plug in p of negative 2. Plug it into the whole polynomial. See what it gives you. If it gives you 0, awesome. That means x minus negative 2, or in other words, x plus 2 would be a factor. If you're thinking to yourself right now, hey, that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, you're right. It is actually a lot of work. It's a huge amount of work. Um, it becomes a big guessing game, and sometimes it doesn't work out for us. But that's the nature of the beast. Anyway, let's see an example real quick. Completely factor this polynomial right here. It's a cubic polynomial, of degree three. We need to completely factor it. Here's how we go about it. Look at your constant term. Our constant term here is minus three. Think about what numbers could be factors of negative three. There's not a lot. That's what's nice about this one. It could be positive one. It could be negative one. It could be positive three, or it could be negative three. There's only four things to check. So at least that's nice. There's not a huge amount to check. We don't know which ones uh, are going to work. No clue at all. Like, I'm going to be honest, I haven't checked this question in advance. I have no clue which ones are going to work here. But we can use the factor theorem, also known as the remainder theorem, to check which ones of these are going to work. We plug any of these into this polynomial, and it, uh, it gives us zero. That tells us it's going to work. I'm going to start with one, just because I think that number is going to be the easiest thing to work with here. Anyway, let's type in one. P of one equals two times one cubed plus seven times one squared plus two times one minus three. That's gonna give me two times, that'll be uh, two plus seven plus two minus three. I don't think this one's gonna work. Yeah, that's eight. Guess what? Positive one doesn't work, it gave us eight. That's okay. Even though we just did something and it didn't work, nothing wrong with that at all. It's okay for it not to work. Let's try the next number. Let me try negative one. P of negative one. That's two times negative one cubed plus seven times negative one squared plus two times negative one minus three, that would become uh, two times negative one is negative two. This becomes, uh, well, if negative one squared is one, so this becomes plus seven. This becomes minus two, this becomes minus three. Uh, negative two plus seven is uh, positive five. Five minus two is three, three minus three, look at that, it's zero. Wow, right, we were able to find a number just by looking at the factors of negative three. We were able to find a number that when we plug it into the whole polynomial, it gives us zero. That's really useful. What this means is uh, negative one will be our quote unquote a value here. In other words, negative one is what we could plug into a binomial to make the whole thing equal to zero. Well, that just means it's going to be x plus one, because if we type in negative one is x, negative one plus one is zero, zero will wipe out the whole polynomial. If you don't like thinking of it this way, just remember it's x minus a. If a is negative one, then x minus negative one, that gives us x plus one that's going to be a factor. Awesome, really, really, really useful. Now, just to save myself a little bit of space, I'm gonna erase the work I did just here. I know how wasteful that seems. Hopefully you have some room on your page that you won't have to do that. Um, but I'm gonna erase my work that I did here because we've now identified uh, which one worked. Hold on, almost there, almost there, awesome, all right. So since we know x plus one is going to be a factor because when you plug in negative one, it makes the whole thing equal to zero, because we know x plus 1 is a factor, we can now use synthetic division on this polynomial to shrink it down to a smaller form. Remember, synthetic division requires us to kind of make a bracket. The thing that you see in your binomial is what you put in the corner here. So there's a positive 1 up in the corner. We are always subtracting. And then let's write out our coefficients here. So uh, we're not missing any, by the way, so we're not skipping an x. Uh, that'll be 2, 7, 2, and negative 3. First term always drops down, and then you start a cross stitch pattern. So one times two is two, seven minus two is five, 
one times five is five, two minus five is negative three, negative three times one is negative three, negative three minus negative three is of course zero. We sure hope it is because that piece is gonna represent our remainder. So that's our remainder. This is our number, this is our X, this is our X squared. That gives us, when we divide this polynomial by X plus one, that gives us two X squared plus five X minus three. That's our leftover quadratic. Here's a nice thing though. We can actually factor this even further. To factor this even further, you have to go back to your factoring methods for math 10 and math 20. I mean, I guess theoretically, you could just continue using this method we've just established and test other things to plug in here, and I'm sure it would work. But at the same time, we also have the adapted sum product rule, which allows us to factor this. So using the adapted sum product rule in this, and we have to use the adapted one because there's a, a, a non one coefficient in front of the x squared. Uh, I know I'm gonna need two numbers with a sum of five and a product of two times negative three, which is negative six. So you gotta think of two numbers that would add together to give you five, but would multiply together to give you negative six. Well, I'm pretty sure that'd be six and negative one. So six and negative one, this gives us two X squared plus six X minus one X minus three. Uh, put brackets around the first two and then brackets around the second two. But notice there was a minus in the middle. Always got to catch that. If there was a minus in the middle, it changes the last sign here. So that's going to become a plus three. Uh, and then think about what we could factor out of this. We could factor out of the first two here. We could take out a two X. So that'll leave us with two X times uh, X plus three uh, minus. Think about what we could take out of these ones. It doesn't really look like anything comes out of it, but something always has to. So we're going to take out a one. So minus one times X plus three. Notice both of these have an X plus three. That tells us we've done this correctly. So this is now fully factored as X plus three times two X minus one. Whew, okay. So long story short, I want you to kind of like take a step back at this. Maybe I'll even just change my pen color real quick. Uh, take a big step, at, step back at this and take a look at what kind of binomials came out of this. We had X plus one. And then once we got this other smaller uh, quadratic here as an answer, we were able to factor it down further to get X plus three and 2x minus 1. So if we're going to completely factor p of x, we can say that p of x, this will be my final answer here, p of x is equal to x plus 1 from this guy up here, x plus 3 from this guy over here, and 2x minus 1 from this guy over here. And notice p of x was a cubic uh, polynomial, a degree 3 polynomial, and we have, in fact, three different factors. So this right here, is our fully factored form uh, of p of x. Why do we care? Well, the nice thing about having it fully factored now, with like I never even looked at a graph of this. I didn't even touch a graph and calculator this whole time. But now that we have it fully factored, if you just found where each of these were equal to zero, you have your x-intercepts. Really, really useful stuff. So anyway, we can get into that a little, little bit later, though. That was very time consuming, right? This whole idea of looking at the, uh, the factors of your last number here and then figuring out, oh, which one's actually going to work. That's really time consuming and it's a big pain. So there must be an easier way, right? It's like an infomercial here. Are you tired of using the integral zero theorem to find the integral zeros and figure out which one's a factor? Well, there's just one handy dandy way of doing this and that's using your graphing calculator. So finding the values of A that are both factors of your constant term, that's your number at the end, and make P of A equal to zero, that can be time consuming. We got lucky on that last question because there was only four different things we had to check and the second one I checked worked. So we, we were really lucky. Um, but honestly, especially if you had a whole bunch of different possible integral zeros to find, uh, it's much faster just to use your graphing calculator to help you find them. So here's how we would do this, right? It's gonna feel a little bit like we're cheating, but like, let's be honest here. It's just like making your calculator do all the heavy lifting for you. Here's how we do this. Step number one is enter your function into y1 in your calculator as if you were in a graph right? So put it into Y1. Step two is press second and then the graph button to bring up a table of values, right? It won't pull up your graph. Like if you press graph, it'll show you what the graph of your function looks like and that's all well and good. But if you press second in the graph, it brings up a table of values. So the table will have like an X column and then it'll have your Y1 column and so on. Uh, now, if your table is kind of wonky because sometimes your settings can get messed up, you can actually reset this by going second and then window and then changing your settings. Uh, if you do that, there's one that'll say like table start. Your table should usually start around zero. And then there's another one that'll say like triangle TBL. That means you're changing your table. That should always, always, always equal one. That's just what your table is going to go up by each time. But anyway, that's an aside. Usually that's not an issue. 
Step three is use your arrow keys to go up and down on the table. You're gonna look for the X values that make your function, which is Y1, equal to zero. So if in your table, you got a bunch of numbers listed and then all of a sudden you say like, oh, X is five, we have Y is zero, bingo. That right there, that's actually gonna be one of your factors. So when you find one, say X is equal to A, or in this example, I kind of doodled right here, X is five, then you know the binomial X minus A, or in this case, X minus five is a factor. What this is really doing is it's just tossing in a bunch of different X values and then spitting out the Y values for each one. So it's like it's throwing a bunch of stuff into the formula for you so you don't have to keep plugging it in over and over again. And it's telling you when it's going to equal zero, right? Uh, now, it's important, however, once you find these, uh, to still do polynomial division after each one. Typically, what I do is I look through my table and I go, OK, which one, which one works nice? I just pick one, and then I do my polynomial division, like synthetic division, from there. Don't get greedy with this shortcut, right? Uh, it's very tempting to go, oh, there's one here, and then there's another one up here, and there's another one there. Boom, done. I've got the whole thing factored. No, that's getting greedy. You still have to know how to do this algebraically. And sometimes some very fishy stuff happens. Sometimes it doesn't always work perfectly. Your synthetic division will help sort that out. We'll deal with that at the very end of our polynomial unit as well. But uh, for now, just make sure you don't get greedy. Just do your synthetic division uh, after each step. So this is what you'll see on your calculator. This is for the previous question that we just did. Uh, you might remember when I plugged in one, when I plugged in X is one, it gave me Y is eight. And I went, oh, darn, it didn't work. But then I plugged in negative one, and notice it gave me zero. You would have been able to see that on your calculator. If you went second table, this is what it pulls up. And you would see that, okay, when X is negative one, Y is zero. So when X is negative one, we have Y is zero. That just means X plus one is a factor because this would make this equal to zero. Or if you prefer, think of it as X minus A. If negative one is A, we have X minus negative one, which still is X plus one. Whatever prefer, whatever you prefer, like whatever floats your boat, go for it, right? Very, very nice shortcut. Even doing this, you would have seen that negative three would have also worked. You could have picked that and gone from there as well. I could have done my synthetic division using that instead. It doesn't make a difference, right? You'd still get the same uh, final answer one way or another. All right, so here's an example. Fully factor P of X equals this. Uh, if I was to not use my graphing calculator, I would have to focus on six. And I'd have to say, okay, I got to try uh, plus or minus one, uh, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, and plus or minus six, right? Those are all the factors of six, right? All of those numbers are factors of six. Uh, there's eight numbers there, right? Four positives and four negatives, right? Eight different numbers to choose from. And since this is a cubic function, there should only be three that work. That, that's, that's quite a shot in the dark, right? I don't want to be at this forever. It's very possible I could start plugging these numbers in and hit five in a row and not get them. Um, that would be really, really annoying. Long story short, I would just take this, plug it into your calculator, and then open up the table. So I'll give you a second, just if you could do that. Pause the video here, plug this into Y1, uh, and then check your table. Okay, so hopefully you were able to do that. I've done this. I pulled up my table. Um, there's a bunch of different zeros that show up. I saw X is negative 3, X is positive 1, and X is positive 2. Maybe I'll even write that in there. Negative 3, positive 1, positive 2. All of these X values on my graph, or sorry, on my table, uh, give me a Y value of zero. So any of those will actually work. Now, if I was to get really greedy here, I would just write, oh, X plus three times X minus one times X minus two, boom, done. I've got it all done. That's ridiculous though. We gotta, we gotta actually do this properly. So what I would do is I would just pick one of them. It doesn't matter which one you pick, whatever you're more comfortable with, pick one of them and start there. I'm gonna pick negative three. So this is our A value. So my X minus A, my X minus negative three here is X plus three. That means X plus three is one of my binomial factors. Let's prove this using synthetic division. So synthetic division says, write what you see. So I see a positive three, do our whole little bracket thing. We always subtract uh, and write out your coefficients. I want you to notice though, we're missing an X squared. Notice it goes from X cubed just to X. So we've got to be careful here. That's a one. Since we're missing x squared, this is zero, and then we have negative seven, and then we have positive six. Bring down your first term, and then start your whole cross stitch pattern. So three times one is three, zero minus three is negative three, three times negative three is negative nine, negative seven minus negative nine is two, three times two is six, 
forgot to do my arrows there, not that that matters. Uh, six minus six is zero. Thank goodness for that. That's our remainder. We should be getting a remainder of zero. So that one certainly does work. What we're left with, this is our number, this is our x, this is our x squared. What we're left with is x squared minus 3x plus 2. So just a quadratic. And even better, it's a quadratic with a leading coefficient of 1. So I can just use my old-fashioned sum product rule on this. So I'm going to look for two numbers with a sum of negative 3 and a product of positive 2. Uh, the two numbers that do that, I believe, are negative 2 and negative 1. So this immediately factors down to x minus 2 and x minus 1. So to write this in fully factored form, we can say p of x equals x plus 3. That was the first one we found right here, right? x plus 3 times x minus 2 times x minus 1, which, as much as you might be rolling your eyes right now, would have matched if I had just done it in the first place using the numbers I found on my graph. But that, that's too greedy, right? The journey is the destination here, as they say. We've, we're better people now because of the work we've done. At least that's what I tell myself when I try to sleep at night. Anyway, let's, let's go on further here. Solving polynomial functions now. When we solve a polynomial p of x, this just means find the values of x that make the function p of x equals zero. So in other words, uh, this is just one step further. When I ask you to solve a polynomial function, you need to factor it first and then find what values will make it equal to zero. In other words, find your x intercepts. So if I were to ask you, ooh, if I were to ask you to solve this last one instead of just saying fully factor, if this question instead said solve, solve p of x, you would need to factor it first. And then you go, okay, x is negative three, x is positive two, and x is positive one. In other words, it's the values of x that make the thing equal to zero. You would have seen that on your table that you would have done, right? That's all that means. Anyway, that's where we're going to go from here. So here's the next example. Solve the following function algebraically. Well, this one's kind of funny. It's already factored for you. Haha, -ha, surprise, April Fools, right? Um, this one's already factored for you. So you don't need to factor it. It's already ready to go. Solve just means find where this whole thing is equal to zero. And since it's already factored, you just have to look at the individual factors and find where they are equal to zero. Let's start with this first one. 2x minus 5. 2x minus 5 is equal to 0 when, if we add 5 and divide by 2, it'd be when x is equal to 2.5. Boom, there's one right there. Awesome. Next one, x minus 7. When is x minus 7 equal to 0? Well, that one's a little easier. Just add 7 on both sides, and we see x is equal to positive 7. There's a solution right there. Awesome. What about this last one? 3x plus 1. When is that equal to 0? Well, minus 1 on both sides, then divide by 3. This one I'd rather write as a fraction. It's negative 1 over 3. Otherwise, I'd be, uh, you know, rounding it to uh, some decimal place because that's a, a non-terminating non decimal. That's it, right? So solving just means set the whole thing equal to zero. If it's already factored, you just look at where each factor is equal to zero. If it's not factored, ooh, then you got to buckle up because then you got to factor the whole thing. It'd be terrible if we ever had to do one of those. Yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? Hmm. Well, there it is right there. So solve the equation algebraically. In other words, um, make sure we get this thing factored and then find where it's equal to zero. All right, I'm going to be honest with you here. This one is the entire reason that I told you guys that uh, that graphing calculator strategy, where you look at the table and all that to find where the zeros are, because think about this integral zero. If we were to truly do this by hand, we would have to test all of the factors of three. That's plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, plus or minus five, plus or minus six, plus or minus 10, plus or minus 15, and plus or minus 30. I hope I didn't miss any there. I don't think I did. But holy Toledo, look at how many different ones there are. There's eight numbers there, and the positive or negative. There'd be 16 different things to check. 16, and it's an x cubed function. So that means only three, three of those 16 things would work. Do you have any idea how long this would take if you're doing it by hand? You would have so many failures before you even found one of them. So long story short, what we need to do is type that into your graphing calculator because honestly nobody's got time for this type this into your graphing calculator and then bring up your table uh, and see where those zeros are going to be i'll let you pause the video here and give that a try okay so at very least i hope you saw on your table what some zeros are uh, i'm looking at my table right now uh, you have to kind of go up and down quite a bit to find some of them um, but the ones that i found uh, and i think these are the only ones because it is a degree three so there should only be three of them i found uh, x is negative five x is positive 2, and x is positive 3. 
Those are the three numbers that would have worked. So look at this, look at all the numbers that we uh, listed out here, negative five, positive two and positive three. Those are the only ones that would have even worked. Wow, all those other ones wouldn't have. I mean, likely you would have started on the far left here and, and worked and eventually you would have gotten to here and then you would have been great, um, but no guarantee. Maybe you just spatball it and like went all over the place. I don't know. Anyway, those ones are gonna be likely ones to work. Uh, well, not even likely ones, they are going to work. Uh, so just set these as your A values. It doesn't matter which one you pick. We wanna show our work either way. I'm just gonna do the, the negative five here. So I'll say this is my A. So that means X minus A, or in other words, X plus five, that's going to be a binomial factor. Because remember, these values that you found make it equal to zero are things that will make binomials equal to zero. So if X was negative five, that would make this binomial equal to zero. Anyway, let's use synthetic division on this. So uh, write what you see, positive five, set up a little bar thing. We always subtract uh, and then write out your coefficients. That's one, uh, just like that other one we did, there's no X squared. So I'll put a zero here, negative 19 and positive 30. Bring down the first term and then start your multiplication cross-stitching thing. So five times one is five, zero minus five is negative five. Five times negative five is negative 25. Negative 19 minus negative 25. I wouldn't mind if you used a calculator on that, but that's going to be positive six. Uh, five times six is 30. 30 minus 30 is zero. Whew, good. We want that last number to be a zero because that's our remainder. If we did this properly, our remainder should have been zero. Anyway, what this leaves us with, this is our number. This is our X. This is our X squared. This leaves us with X squared minus five X plus six. Notice that that is just a, a quadratic, right? It's a degree two polynomial. You can factor this using some previous methods from other math courses. In particular, this one is just a normal sum product rule. So we're gonna look for two numbers with a sum of negative five and a product of positive six. Like I always say, focus on the product. What numbers would multiply to give us six? Uh, well, I think what's gonna give us a product of six, but a sum of negative five would be negative six and positive one. Hmm, wait a minute. No, that doesn't work because that would be a negative six. Hmm. Oh, never mind. I got it wrong. It would be negative three and negative two. Yes, that's better. Negative three plus negative two would be negative five. Negative three times negative two is positive six. My mistake, right? Anyway, I corrected myself at least though. So negative three and negative two, that's X minus three and X minus two. And wait a minute, we should have even known that because we cheated by look, looking at our graph and calculator here. Uh, two and three, that would have been X minus two and X minus three. There they are anyway. But it is still important that we do this algebraically. We need to show our work. We can't get too lazy here. Anyway, so in fully factored form, this is X plus five times X minus three times X minus two. And we wanna see where that is equal to zero. So this is our factored form, but because it wants us to solve, we have to go to that one extra little step and say what numbers would make this equal to zero. Now I know how silly this seems because our graphing calculator told it to us right at the very beginning. But as you can see, it's going to be X is negative five. There's one. X is positive three. There's the next one. And X is positive two. There's the last one. And yes, our graphing calculator told us this, but we needed to do it algebraically. The whole point, the whole reason I tell you to get your graphing calculator out and do that is so that you don't have to plug in all 16 of those numbers right there. That would be a huge pain, right? It would take forever before you found one of them. I'm just trying to save you some trouble here, right? And let's be real, like it, it's a tool, we can use it anyway. Just because it says algebraically doesn't mean we can't use a tool to help us find those things in the first place. You probably would use the calculator to plug it into the polynomial anyway. So what, what difference does it make? Anyway, we got one last question and whoo, looks like beef's back on the menu, boys. This one is a beefcake. Look at this, this is a degree four, degree four polynomial. This one's gonna take some extra time here. So solve the function algebraically, just like the last one. If we were to test this using the integral zero theorem, we would have to check all of the factors of 24. There's like a million of them. I'm not even gonna bother listing them out like I've done before. Let's just cut right to the chase. Throw this directly into your graphing calculator and check the table. I'm doing this right now. You might wanna pause the video here and make sure you do that. Okay, so you probably unpaused by now, but I'm still plugging it in. Look how big this polynomial is right now. Anyway, I'm opening up my table. It looks to me like there is a bunch in here that will work. The ones that I see right now uh, are negative four, negative two, one, and three. 
And that makes sense that we have four different ones here because it was a degree four function. So there could be as many as four different solutions to this. You could have less, that's fine as well, um, but you should certainly have you know, up to four, right? So that works just fine. Now, it doesn't matter which one you pick. You can pick any one to start with. You're gonna need to end up using some synthetic division on this one way or another. I'm just gonna pick negative four just because it was the furthest to the left and I just thought, why not, right? So uh, if this is my A value, if A is negative four, then X minus A, X minus negative four is X plus four. Or in other words, negative four, if you plug this in here and make this whole thing equal to zero, that means it's gonna be a factor, right? Anyway, that's what I'm gonna do to use my synthetic division here. So positive four, draw my little box, always a subtraction. I just write that sign anyway, just so I remember what I'm doing. List out your coefficients. We're not missing any coefficients here. So you just write out what you see. That's gonna be one, two, negative 13, negative 14, and 24. Um, I have to make that a little bit bigger there. Drop down the first term. So one's gonna drop down here and then you start your cross stitch. So four times one is four, two minus four is negative two, four times negative two is negative eight, negative 13 minus negative eight is negative five, four times negative five is negative 20, negative 14 minus negative 20 is positive six, four times six is 24, 24 minus 24 is zero. Whew. That's our remainder, good, that tells us it worked. List out this, remember start on the right, this is our number, this is our x, this is our x squared, this is our x cubed. This leaves us with x cubed minus 2x squared minus 5x plus 6. Now here's the real kicker. In the other previous questions we've done where we were solving it or fully factoring it, we ended up having a quadratic. I want you to notice that this is not a quadratic. We're left with a cubic. In other words, we got to do this all over again. We have to do another round of synthetic division. That's why I say I'm beefs back on the menu, right? This one, this one takes some time. Uh, here's some good news. These factors that you found up here, we already did negative four. If you did it the same way as I did, we already did negative four. Uh, you can just reuse these ones. These ones are going to work. I can tell you that right now. You don't have to retest this or anything. You can if you want to, um, but you can just retry uh, any of these ones right here. So I'm going to move on to the next one. X, uh, where A is negative two, that would mean X plus two should be another factor. Let's throw this one in. Hopefully it works. I mean, it really, really should. But anyway, do another round of synthetic division on this positive two, draw your box, we always subtract. This time around, since we're dividing this cubic function, we'll list the coefficients on the cubic function here. So that'll be one, negative two, negative five, and positive six. Drop the first term down, and then start your cross stitch. So two times one is two, negative two minus two is negative four, two times negative four is negative eight, Negative five minus negative eight is positive three. Two times three is six. Six minus six is zero. Good, that was our remainder of zero there. And this gives us our number, our X and our X cubed. Whew. Long story short, that leaves us with one X squared uh, minus four X plus three. That is now a uh, quadratic function and just like a normal sum product rule one too, right? So you can use sum product rule in this. Two numbers that have a sum of negative four, but a product of positive three. Well, that'd be negative three and negative one, right? So this becomes X minus three times X minus one. Now, just to wrap this whole thing up, uh, identify all the factors that you used. Uh, this was one I used here. This is one I used here. And then these ones right here, there's four of them. It was a degree four polynomial. That makes perfect sense. So I can write this now as P of X equals X plus four times X plus two times X minus three times x minus one. And yes, I know I've said this before. Yes, your graphing calculator would have kind of told you that right there anyway, but you do need to show your work. I know you guys aren't really gonna argue with me on that one, but it is what it is. Anyway, last thing we gotta do here is this very pesky word where it said solve. I cannot stress the importance of making sure you know before you even finish the question or even start the question that you know where you're supposed to be headed with the question. Um, solve means we need to find the values of x that make this equal to zero. The reason I say this is oftentimes on quizzes or tests, I've had students in the past uh, go through all of this work here and factor the whole thing and then forget that what they were really tasked to do was to solve it. So then they just stopped here and they didn't list out their solutions. You're not going to get full marks if you do that. You have to tell me what the solutions are. The good news is when I ask you to solve, that just means find where this whole thing's equal to zero. 
Once it's factored, you just look at where each individual piece is equal to zero. And it's going to be these numbers that we wrote up here in the first place, but it is what it is. Anyway, this first one will be x is negative 4. Boom, there's one of them. Next one, x is negative 2. There's the other one. Next one will be x is positive 3. That would make that piece equal to zero. So good. And then the last one would be x is positive 1, because that would be what would make that last piece equal to zero. So any of those four numbers that I just boxed down there, any of those four numbers plugged into that polynomial would make the whole thing equal to zero. Therefore, they are our solutions. Whew. All right, that was the toughest question of the day. We are almost done, home stretch. Uh, you can also solve polynomials graphically. I think you already probably have put this together by now, but if you haven't, that's okay. Uh, you can find your solutions, also known as your zeros or x-intercepts graphically too. You just use your graphing calculator to confirm the solutions uh, of the previous function here, right? So if we were to, to do this exact same function again from the last example, if you were to throw it in your graphing calculator and instead of pressing table, press graph, this is what you would get. Now, just keep in mind, I changed my window, just the Y part of my window a little bit. This right here is my graph. Notice you can clearly see one, two, three, four. So there's negative four, negative two, one, and three. And I mean, looking at our table again, negative four, negative two, one, and three, it all matches up. Not a huge surprise, right? So our solutions are another way of saying our x-intercepts. You can do it algebraically like we did with all that work on that last uh, slide we did there, or you can just do it graphically. But let's be honest here, 99% of the time, I'm gonna ask you to do it algebraically. That's it. Told you it was a long lesson, but hey, 40-ish minutes, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. So for practice, and believe me, you do need practice at this, as time-consuming as it is, page 134, questions 5 to 13. Uh, and of course, we still have our chapter 3 assignment. You can now complete up to question 12. Your work's cut out for you. Make sure you're asking for help if you need it. Make sure you've mastered this. It's a lot, but it is a very, very important skill. Anyway, if you need help, please reach out.